Greetings, everybody. I'm Don Richthaldar, and on behalf of the School of Law, University of KwaZulu-Natal, I bid you all welcome to this online colloquium on the topic of the emergence of an African bioethics. I would like to thank our partner, the Genetics and Bioethics Network of the International Association of Bioethics, for their wonderful support in organizing this colloquium. We are privileged to have a panel of five illustrious speakers. During the first half of today's colloquium, our panel of speakers will share their insights with us. During the second half of the colloquium, we will be inviting comments and questions from all participants. We are recording this colloquium and we will make it available on our website. Just as a matter of protocol, may I please ask everybody to keep their microphones on mute. Now, to open this colloquium, I would like to introduce Professor Pierre Effa. Professor Effa has a long history of involvement in bioethics and championing bioethics, especially here on the African continent. Professor Effa is currently the president of the Pan-African Congress of Ethics, and bioethics. Professor Effa, we look forward to your opening address. I think, Professor Effa, if you can just uh, un unmute yourself. Um, All right. Do you hear me? Yeah. Is it okay? Perfect. Yes. Yes, we hear okay. you. Perfect. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful to you, Professor Tarda, and your team at the School of Law of the University of Kwazulu-Nata, the organizers of this webinar, for the great honor of inviting me to this seminar to deliver the opening address. The bioethics movement in Africa was born within the framework of the international intercultural dialogue with multidisciplinary contributions of reference among both Westerners and Africans. I hope that the, that collaboration with an African legal institution of law starting today can become a reality indeed at the very beginning of the bioethics movement in africa men and women of law played a decisive role alongside doctors philosophers anthropologists historians theologians, religious and traditional moral authorities, before the wars were institutionalized by the political powers, in particular, the African head of state of the, organ of the organization of African unity and then African Union. I will mention here the contribution of Mohamed Betawi from Algeria, then president of the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Ebon Baye, then president of the Supreme Court of 
Senegal, and Madame Marie Madeleine Boronsu, President of the Constitutional Court of Gabon. These high ranking legal personalities were also among the very first members of the International Biases Committee of UNESCO, created in 1993. That contribution have, will have made it possible to stress the need to create, as a matter of priority, a legal framework and appropriate institutions. Doctors insisted on establishing the same standards in the practice of biomedical ethics research in Africa as in the West, and above all, to prohibit the holding in Africa, clinical and pharmaceutical trials that would not take place elsewhere, but would, would start with African populations. Philosophers, historians, and anthropologists, especially traditional and religious moral authorities, demanded reflection on life and its protection according to the African conception in relation to the African Renaissance. The personalities of reference here are Jesuit Angel Benveng from Cameroon, historian and philosopher, and also philosopher and anthropologist Honora Agesti from Benin. I propose a text for my scientific communication for your publication. Allow me to give you a brief overview of, of it during the remaining time of my speech here. Above all, I'm going to present to you the African paradigm of bioethics. The question, the issue of bioethics in Africa, according to the African paradigm of bioethics, is to answer the question, do you belong to the camp of life or to the camp of death? And according to the African cosmology in connection with African philosophy and African spirituality. The mission of the African bioethicist is to make sure of the triumph of the forces of life over the force, the forces of death. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor yes. Efa. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Professor Thaddeus Metz. Professor Metz is the head of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Pretoria and a renowned scholar of Ubuntu. Professor Metz keep himself busy with the deep questions in philosophy. One of the most thought provoking books that I have ever read was his book on the meaning of life. Today, Professor Metz will present his views on an Afro communal bioethics. Thank you, Professor, Professor Metz. Thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, let me start by saying 
um, what's interested me in African bioethics. I think some others are interested in uh, appealing to African values when thinking about medical ethics uh, for reasons of relativism. Some people think African values for African people, Western values for Western people. Um, other people are interested in African bioethics for reasons of redress, uh, the thought that um, uh, uh, indigenous sub-Saharan ways of interpreting the world were suppressed and now it's time for some kind of compensation and so uh, extra attention. Um, those are common rationales, but they haven't been my rationales for being interested in an African bioethic. Uh, instead, I've been drawn towards African values when thinking about medical ethics because I think they're plausible. Uh, they're attractive um, uh, and insightful uh, relative to many other uh, moral traditions around the world. Um, and I want to make a short, uh, a short case for that uh, in the next 10 minutes or so. Uh, what I'll first do uh, is, is sketch the way I interpret uh, the African moral tradition. Um, I'll motivate it a bit as both African and uh, plausible as an ethic, and then I'll apply it to two or three uh, controversies pertaining to, uh, to genetics. In terms of interpreting the ethic, it's useful to start uh, uh, with what's familiar to many people. Um, in Southern Africa, when we want to sum up African approaches to morality, we often say a person is a person through other persons. And that maxim is very common, um, and it's an accurate literal translation of many local sayings, but it doesn't mean anything in plain English. Um, you have to already be familiar with African cultures to know what a person is a person through other persons means. And a lot of my work has been a matter of providing a particular interpretation of it that is fairly determinant and specific uh, and would be attractive to a global audience of ethicists and moral philosophers and the like. Uh, so here's a very brief sketch uh, of how I interpret this phrase. Uh, when we say a person is a person, that, that much is easy. Uh, 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 implicit in that is a, is a prescription to become a real person uh, or a genuine person or a complete person, to develop one's humanness, really. How does one do that? Well, through other persons um, and more specifically uh, through relating with them in harmonious or communal ways. Um, and it's important to be specific about what harmony or communal uh, communality might amount to. Uh, roughly for me, they uh, uh, consist of sharing a way of life with others and caring for others' quality of life. So to relate harmoniously with another person is roughly to enjoy a sense of togetherness with her and to participate with her and on a cooperative basis, um, uh, uh, to think of oneself as a we and to engage in a trusting way. On the one hand, that's to share a way of life. And on the other hand, I think uh, relating harmoniously or communally is well understood as caring for the other that is uh, doing what's likely to help her, make her life go better, objectively speaking, that is in terms of meeting her needs, uh, doing it for her own sake, and often doing it out of sympathy. Um, I've appealed to this particular conception of harmony or, or community uh, in my ethic, uh, which roughly says, treat beings with respect insofar as they're capable of being party to relationships of harmony uh, or community. Um, so the thought is uh, that uh, normal adult human beings, the ones participating in this workshop, uh, have a full moral status or a dignity because they can harmonize with others and be harmonized with. So everyone engaged here can roughly cooperate with other people and, uh, and go out of their way to help others. Um, and so they're the most important uh, beings, morally speaking, from this perspective. There are other beings in the world, though, uh, that can't uh, uh, cooperate or help uh, with, co can't cooperate with or help us, but we can with them. Um, so my cat is on the couch here. He can't go out of his way to advance my goals or meet my needs, but I can do those things uh, for him. And so uh, by this ethic, he's got a partial moral status. He, he matters uh, for his own sake. Um, uh, on the other hand, there are other beings in the world that can't uh, uh, harmonize as subjects or as objects. And good examples are rocks and plants. Um, they don't have goals, they don't have a quality of life, uh, they've got no consciousness for all we know, um, and so they lack a moral standing by this ethic. I think a principle telling us to treat beings as important insofar as they can uh, relate harmoniously or communally uh, is attractive uh, philosophically and also has pretty good African credentials. 
Um, so I think if you look at a lot of what's intuitively tra attractive about indigenous sub-Saharan cultures, for example, the focus on consensus and decision-making, uh, the drive for reconciliation uh, after wrongdoing, uh, the approach to collective labor uh, when undertaking harvesting or, or, or building. I think all these things are well understood as uh, motivated by an interest in harmonious or communal relationships. They're all ways of forging a sense of togetherness, uh, cooperating, helping one another, and doing so for one another's sake. Um, uh, and in my work, I, I try to uh, uh, suggest that this, this appeal, appeal to this particular conception of harmony or com communality uh, makes good sense of, of a lot of the African tradition. But I want to turn now to plausibility. Why should we take this way of understanding morality seriously? Um, here, here are three quick reasons in the context of bioethics. Number one, I think it's a, it gives us an attractive account of animal moral status. So for Kantians, it's very difficult to ascribe animals any moral status since they lack personhood or autonomy or rationality. In contrast, utilitarians tend to go to the opposite extreme and think that animals have a full moral status comparable to us because we and animals are both capable of pleasure and pain or capable of uh, preference satisfaction or dissatisfaction. In contrast, I think the right thing to say about animals is that they matter for their own sake, um, uh, but they just don't matter as much as we do. Um, uh, and in case of a, of a forced trade-off, if we have to choose between the life of my cat or, or my life, uh, I would hope you'd pick me. Uh, that would be the morally right thing to do. Um, and uh, this bioethic gives us a good account of why that is. Uh, I'm capable of relating harmoniously as a subject, uh, uh, whereas my cat is not. Second uh, thing going for this ethic, I think, is its ability to capture norms of informed consent. So uh, for the Kantian, we need to respect informed consent because of respect for autonomy. Uh, the utilitarian will say if we undertake medical research or uh, a treatment on a person without her informed consent, she's less likely to participate with us and so less likely to continue in the study or take her medicine. Uh, in contrast, the African bioethic I've expounded gives us a, a third and also plausible account of why informed consent is so important. And from this perspective, it would be that if we don't obtain informed consent, we're flouting a norm of uh, sharing a way of life with others. Right? We don't enjoy a sense of togetherness with others and we're not cooperating with them uh, if we trick them into taking some medicine or, or threaten them uh, to do so. So we get a different relational understanding of, of the importance of informed consent that I think is prima facie plausible. And here's a third reason to take the ethics seriously is I think it gives us an attractive account of the obligations of medical practitioners. So it's a widespread intuition that if you've got a long standing patient, that patient has some priority relative to some other patient that isn't yours, but you could help to an equal or, or somewhat uh, larger degree. The Kantian will say, well, that you medical practitioner, you must have promised uh, to, uh, uh, to help your existing patient, your longstanding patient. The utilitarian will say, well, if you dump your longstanding patient in favor of the new patient, you're not gonna know as much about the new patient and you won't be as efficient in, in treating her. But in contrast, from an African perspective, we can say that once you've related communally with somebody, once you've shared a way of life with someone and cared about her quality of life to an intense degree or for a long time, you have an extra obligation to continue that relationship and to enrich it. So we often find in the African tradition that the, the maxims of family first or charity begins at home. And I've given you a philosophical reconstruction of, of, of that. So I'm hoping you accept some the African credentials of this bioethic, and I hope it looks prima facie attractive to you. And now let me apply it to three controversies uh, concerning genetics. The first one I want to think about is research on human embryos. So it's possible to genetically edit embryos. Uh, we can tinker with embryos and risk or even foresee uh, their death. Uh, and, it's, and it's quite a matter of some controversy of, of whether this is permissible. I don't have a conclusive answer to the question of whether it's right or wrong, but what I can say is that in light of the ethic of harmony, if uh, 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 manipulating human embryos is wrong, 
it's not wrong because of how that embryo is treated. There has to be some other explanation of, of the wrongness if it's going to be wrong. Why wouldn't it wrong the human embryo? Well, uh, by my account, it, it lacks a moral status. Right? It can't harmonize with us. It doesn't have uh, any consciousness, so far as we know. And we can't also harmonize with it. Uh, it doesn't have any goals that we could further. We can't enjoy a sense of togetherness with an embryo. Uh, it doesn't have a quality of life that we can improve or reduce. Uh, we can't sympathize with it because it doesn't have any feelings for all we know. Um, and so uh, by this ethic, uh, it lacks a moral status. And so that if we, uh, if we risk uh, uh, killing it, um, we don't wrong it. But again, I leave open the possibility that there would be some other wrong that might be committed. Here's a second case to think about. Uh, in the light of the, the Afro-communal ethic, and that's one of disclosure. So uh, imagine uh, a medical researcher does some, uh, uh, looks at the, uh, the genes of uh, a nuclear family, a father, a mother, and a child, and discovers that the uh, a child is not uh, 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 biologically related to the father, uh, where the father doesn't know. Uh, but let us suppose in this thought experiment that mom does know. Uh, and just refuses to tell the father. What do you do as, uh, as somebody who now has this, uh, this sensitive information? Um, again, I don't have a complete uh, firm answer to that question. I think a lot depends on the details. But what I can say uh, is that this ethic of harmony directs us to look at the nature of the relationships between the man and the woman uh, uh, and that if the, we were to disclose the information to the man, if we were to tell him, look, you're, you're not the biological father of this child, I don't think we would be wronging the woman. Why not? Well, because of that principle, family first. Once you've been engaged in a communal or harmonious relationship for some time, you incur extra duties uh, to go out of your way uh, uh, to enrich uh, those ties. Um, and supposing the man and the woman have been together for a while, she owes it uh, to tell him uh, 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 about his status. If she hasn't done so, then she's failed in her duty to him. And if we were then to disclose the information to him, it might be wrong, all things considered. We might be wronging the child, threatening the child in some way, uh, and disrupting the family. But we wouldn't be doing her an injustice, which I think is a revealing point. Uh, usually when we think about this kind of dilemma, we think of, on the one hand, a right to individual privacy, and on the other hand, a public interest, a uh, kind of abstract uh, greater good. And this ethic of relationship would have us look at the relationships uh, uh, involved uh, with the people in coming to a decision. Here's a third case uh, to think about. Uh, 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 third implication of uh, the Afro-communal bioethic, and that concerns uh, genetic enhancements. So someday we might be able to tinker with genes to make people more intelligent and taller and more beautiful. Um, uh, and again, I'm not here to give you a conclusive answer to whether such things are right or wrong, but rather to highlight uh, a moral controversy about uh, uh, this kind of project. Um, that hasn't been discussed, but that I think should be discussed intuitively and that the relational ethic of harmony or community draws our attention to. If some people were to be enhanced, uh, and not everyone, right? if some people were much more intelligent, much taller, much more beautiful uh, than others, then it would be harder for there to be relationships of harmony and com uh, community uh, in society. Right? It would be, be harder to enjoy a sense of togetherness, to think of ourselves as a we, and even it would be harder to cooperate and help one another. So it's well known that uh, if you become uh, rich financially, uh, if you acquire lots of money, you will tend to become more selfish uh, and less empathetic and, and less inclined to identify with others uh, uh, who are not rich. Uh, the evidence on that is pretty good over the past five or ten years. And what I'm suggesting is something similar would probably apply to those who become biologically rich, right? Uh, even if they don't have lots of money, uh, if they've got other talents uh, and abilities that lots of other people lack, there's going to be a differential, uh, that kind of difference in status and standing and ability is going to prevent people uh, uh, from, uh, from coming together in a way that an ethic of harmony uh, would prescribe. So uh, uh, I think my time is up. Um, uh, I've expounded an, uh, an African bioethic, and I hope I've made the case in this past 10, 12 minutes 
uh, that it's worth taking seriously uh, at a philosophical level, level when it comes to thinking about genetic controversies. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Metz. Um, I, I, I must say a thought-provoking presentation and, and, I, and I was looking at some of the faces and looking at the reaction while, while, you, while you were speaking. And it was quite, uh, quite interesting and insightful how people smiled at certain of the, of the more controversial aspects or the controversial ethical issues that, that you have raised, such as genetic enhancement and so forth. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is, is Dr. Iyoki. Dr. Iyoki is currently a research specialist at Michigan State University. He has a multidisciplinary background in philosophy, international relations, journalism, and teaching. We look forward to his presentation on bio-eco-communitarianism. Dr. Iyoki. Thank you very much for welcoming me. Um, first of all, is it possible to share my screen? Absolutely. Or do I just... Okay. Absolutely. Um, I, um, so, so you can just... Um, um, I, I trust you know how it works. So you can yeah, just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, can I see it? Um, it Yes, yes. Good. Taking a little while to respond, but okay. Perfect, perfect. Okay, good, good. So Yes, one general remark before I continue with this uh, presentation <clears throat> is that uh, bioethics uh, or bioeco-communalism or bioeco-communitarianism, which uh, from now on I'm going to refer to as BEC. As you can see, it's a long word, so let's just go with Beck, okay? It's meant to address the overall issues within bioethics in Africa, um, but in this presentation, I'll be focusing mostly on the research ethics part of bioethics. Hence, I'm going to first talk about um, the mission that I am getting to accomplish. Um, so it is primarily to correct the inadequacies of research ethics um, that way we would be able to build a suitable structure for practice in Africa. Um, so rather than do away with the mainstream principles that we are all familiar with, Beck actually calls for careful adop adoption and adaptation of those principles, in other words, indigenizing them into the African context. Um, it's a way to create a homegrown formula that speaks to local cultural needs of continental Africa. Um, we can't stress enough the need for research ethics principles to reflect the local character of the African cultural climate. Um, the point being that Beck is proposed here as a guiding construct that integrates standard research ethics principles with multicultural principles. Um, so international best practices are made to conform or fit within the African character and communitarian mantra. So I talk about uh, the point of departure and by this I mean where the idea that I'm proposing differs from the mainstream that you're familiar with. Um, we're all familiar with uh, the Belmont Report, for example, and its underlying emphasis on, for example, respect for autonomy and respect for persons, which of course is very important. We recall the abuses of Nuremberg and Tuskegee and several others. But the Belmont Report, for example, is an orientation or set of frameworks 
that is largely Western construction, I'm not saying anything new, and influenced by the likes of uh, Kant's deontology, uh, Emerson's transcendentalism, um, J.S. Mill and Bentham's utilitarianism, to name just th these three examples. But we are also aware that its individualistic tendencies make it not very suitable in communalist settings, such as what we have in Africa. Um, and I can uh, give one example of uh, two authors who jointly made a statement that you're seeing here to the fact that there has always been an undercurrent resistance, undercurrent of resistance to the individualistic autonomy-based, autonomy-driven mainstream orientation with, within bioethics. So in effect, to continue to apply this individualistic approach is like disregarding cultural and national circumstances and imposing Western values on distant communities and cultures in a place like Africa. And that amounts to cultural overreach, which is why some critics think that resolving research ethics issues in Africa using Western ideas is a form of ethical imperialism, but yet another neocolonialism. So another, to extend this uh, point of departure that I'm talking about, um, yeah, I'm making an attempt to amend that autonomy-based practice and introduce a more encompassing communalist model, which in my view is more culturally appropriate to the African setting. So when it comes to applying research ethics, especially in non-Western environments, such as Africa, the perfect metaphor is to uproot what we normally know, hybridize, and then replant in order to make it suitable to what we need in Africa. It's a way to acknowledge and integrate African philosophical and cultural perspective uh, as a counterweight to the Western tendency to privilege individualism over communalism, much of what uh, Professor Metz was just talking about in clinical research. To continue in that, in that line of thinking, um, this is where Beck comes in. And the understanding of Beck, or if I have to say, it, it is construed as a social construct in African philosophy that describes the immersion in and inseparability of the individual, which we all know in our understanding of the definition of the individual in African context or philosophy as a life force uh, from his or her environment and community, given rise to Beck. In research ethics, Beck examines the development of jointly constructed understandings of the world that form the basics for shared assumptions about reality. Um, for instance, the notion of human being, again, Professor uh, Metz made reference to this, uh, is very different. The notion of a human being, say, research participant, is one that is intimately embedded within their social group. And this social group can be family, uh, neighborhood, village, and their immediate environment, which includes social, physical, uh, spiritual, all of which are constantly and uh, uh, in intricately uh, interacting in a loop. For example, informed consent, will take on a different meaning uh, 
a researcher might end up getting informed consent, not just from an adult research participant, but from his or her spouse as well. It can also extend to the family and on and on. Or at least the researcher should anticipate a possibility of this being the case. So to further on with the, uh, the tenet of Beck, I'll have to emphasize that Beck approach respects, recognizes and respects individual autonomy but also recognizes that research participants in multicultural milieus are embedded in family, kinship, community, and the environment. In essence, Beck recognizes mainstream research ethics principles, which we all know the four principles, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice, but that notwithstanding, they are not, these principles are not an all purpose set of tools that sufficiently serves the humongous global bioethics enterprise, or in this uh, specific case, research ethics. The, the proposal that I'm putting forward here requires extra level or layer of knowledge and competencies uh, in aspects of relevant subjects, areas like African philosophy, African studies, African religion, African languages or linguistics generally, sociology, history, you name them. Research ethicists should also be able to collaborate across relevant disciplines like biology, nursing, public health, um, and by the way, let me make a plug here, if I may, that some of these points that I've raised here, I've discussed in my 2018 book, Clinical Trials and African Person. Um, but more importantly, a more expansive book volume with uh, prospective authors from many countries across Africa and other places, tentatively titled From the Ground Up, a Field a uh, field guide for African research ethics, which is yet to be published because we are still working on it, is planned to explore more of the issues in greater details. And I have to also mention that Professor Metz is one of the prospective uh, authors, and I'm sure that there are other prospective authors that are participating in this, uh, in this discussion today. Um, So on that note, let me make uh, my conclusion that we have work cut out for us. When I say we, I mean African bioethicists. And that is the challenge to formulate an appropriate blueprint for research ethics practice in Africa. The communitarian approach, which by the way, aligns well with the goals of public health has become a force to be reckoned with. Um, a careful delineation and recalibration of this understanding should be a teaching moment for researchers, clinicians, bioethicists, students, academics, and so on, as they confront multicultural perspectives in health research. Uh, it is an established fact that the freedom of the individual should never trump the common good or the public interest. Um, for too long, individualism has weighed disproportionately, as you can see in this illustration, uh, and drives much of bioethics today. My hope is that Beck, as a tool among many tools, is primed to balance the playing field uh, somewhat with multicultural approach. And my parting thought is that while bioethics practice in Africa is generally the same as elsewhere, it must, however, be specifically shaped by the histories, mythologies, motives, 
uh, beliefs and ethos of the people who constitute African cultural affinity. And that's my last word. Thank you for, my, for listening. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, thank you, Dr. Yoki, and we are definitely looking forward to, to your book. We will, be, we will be watching the new CC when your, your book um, appears. I apologize for my, my voice. I was almost sounding like Anthony Fauci. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> thank you. Um, our next speaker is Professor Gundren. Professor Ogundran hails from Benin and currently works at the University of Liverpool in the United Kingdom. Uh, he does research in epidemiology, internal medicine, neurology, and of course, bioethics. His paper will pose the question, is there perhaps a generational gap when it comes to an African bioethics? I'm mute. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> okay, I will mute now. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, yes. great, great, great. Yeah, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, and thanks for having me on this forum. Um, I think I would like to share my screen as well. So that, um, let me just uh, do that quickly. Right. Can you, can you see that? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Is it okay now? They're, they're starting. Yes. It's coming up. Yep. Uh, um, Is it okay? Yes, I think uh, it's perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, that's right. Yes. Yeah, so um, I will just be sharing with us today um, our experience with uh, a qualitative research conducted in one of the African countries and what we found. It was an unexpected finding, uh, what we call incidental finding. Um, and it's really something I think we, as African bioethicists, we need to uh, focus on. So just a brief outline of what I'll do. Uh, the introduction will be very brief because um, the other speakers have touched on it. Then I will give a summary of this study, give a brief discussion, talk about the concept of generations and social capital theory as it applies to this finding, and give some of the implications, especially uh, regarding uh, genomic research in Africa. Yeah. So we've We've heard a lot about uh, African uh, communitarianism, and there is a lot of literature coming up now talking about consent for research participation in Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, if you are if you're privileged to have you know, gone through some of this literature, um, the influence of communalism, which centered on the values of solidarity, altruism, and collective benefits uh, have been so much highlighted and also the significance of community gatekeepers. So when we set out to do this study, which is a fairly large study, um, it's a study that was looking at the facilitators often the barriers to consenting to donate bow specimens for genomic research in indigenous sub-Saharan African communities. So our hypothesis, I mean, what we thought was that the prospective research participants were likely to agree to participate in genomic research based on communitarian values. I mean, such values like solidarity, altruism, you know, communal benefits. So we designed a qualitative study. The methodological design was adapted from grounded theory. And for those who are qualitative researchers, you are familiar with this. And we used the constant comparative method of that analysis and uh, this was aided by Atlas TI. Our research stakeholders, we concentrated on research stakeholders, which include the research scientists, prospective research participants from the community, 
And of course, we also include the gatekeepers, the community rulers and the opinion leaders. And um, while we're on the field, um, and during the process of interviewing our uh, research participants, one of them alluded to the fact that the community health workers are very important when it comes to um, engaging the community in genomic research. So we had to include the community health workers in our, in our, uh, in our study. So the, basically the study uh, until um, obtaining data by key informant interviews and uh, uh, focus group discussion. So just to give a quick rundown of what we found, um, we con conducted focus group discussions, 15 focus group discussions comprising 50 res prospective research participants. And we organized the research participants by age and sex. Uh, we grouped them to adults and youths. And the adults again were subcategorized into males and females. We, we did all that because uh, we wanted to ensure that we're able to delve into uh, the impact of gender and um, uh, the impact of um, gender inequality, especially in African uh, setting, where you have um, the voices of the females not being heard in families by virtue of the fact that the males are supposed to be the head of the homes, the family heads. And then we also consider the youths because um, we, we noticed that in previous studies, uh, oftentimes when focus group discussions have been done, the youths are not uh, particularly focused. You know, they tend to be grouped together and then people just subcategorize participants into males and females. And um, when, we, when, we, when, when we discuss with the youths, we also subcategorize them into males and females. Um, towards the end of the study, we had to uh, set up a mixed group of youths and adults because of our findings so that we can get uh, we can get our data to be saturated, theoretical saturation. At the end of that study, we discovered that there was clear division between the adults and the youths regarding the decision to participate in genomic research. The adults based their values, of course, on the traditional African communalism. Their emphasis is on communal benefits. So for instance, um, you can see from this uh, table there, the first narrative from one of the adults is that the benefits is to the whole community, and that is important. Not so much to the individual. Emphasis must be on the community. But if you look through the narratives of the youths, their focus is on what is in it for me, more of what will I benefit. It's not that the youths did not recognize the place of the community leadership, but they felt that when it comes to participating in genomic research, they, are, they, 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 they will agree to participate because of the benefit that will first come to them. And um, some of the youths also mentioned that once they know it's going to benefit them, then they will get their family members informed. They will also inform their neighbors but their decision is not going to be tied to what the community, community leaders are saying. Um, this was a very clear this division that we found. So the, this slide is just showing, showing us the word cloud for the adult participants. I mean, we subject the narratives of the adults to Atlas TI, and you can see they are very clearly, right in the middle of it is community. So the adults are more focused on the communal values. We will participate as long as the community is going to benefit. Don't worry about myself. As an individual, that doesn't really matter. It's what the community says. And meanwhile, when we look at the work plan for the youth participants, we discover that what they're interested in is their personal benefits. However, around the personal will, you have the family, the parents. So they, they are not completely neglecting their close relations, but they emphasize the fact their decision is not based on communal values. So the summary can be put in these two statements. They had us base their decision on to participate on altruism, furthering the common good. 
while the youth based their decision on personal benefits and preferences, but they also took into account the views and the welfare of their family members and neighbors. Um, we try to explain this and contextualize it within the model of relative solidarity among the youths, which is different from the typical solidarity model that is found in African community Iranism. Um, we have we published this already uh, in, the, in the journal indicated, indicated there. But what I want to highlight in my shorter discussion today is that of the, 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 the concept of generational shifts. We look at the narratives of the, of the heart of these cousins and we're able to come up with this social networking, which seems to typify the adult participants in our study. We discover that the adult community member tends to interact, either bidirectional interaction or unidirectional interaction with community leadership, some of them are family heads, they interact with other family heads, they interact with the local health centers, religious leaders, and their social groups. Whereas the social networking for the youths was slightly different. The youths talk more of their family members, interacting with their family members. The interaction with the community leadership is unidirectional. It's not bidirectional. This diagram you are seeing is based on our, our data. Their interaction also with the circle of friends appear to be unidirectional, with religious leaders appear to be unidirectional, but we find a number of them talking about obtaining information from the internet, from social media. They, they prefer to, cons no, to, to go to the social media or go onto the, onto the internet to get information on what genomic research is, what are the benefits for them to have a better understanding of what it is before they go on to give their consent to participate in genomic research. I mean, that introduces, that introduces a different concept to what we used to think about the, the African people in terms of um, what should be the ethos upon which informed consent should be based. So I will briefly now explain generational shift and social capital theory. Now, the social networking, which I've just talked about, can be contextualized within the framework of social capital theory. Now, um, for those who are familiar with this, they're based on technological advancements and influences. Generations from 1940s has been divided into four. We have the baby bloomers, generation X, Generation Y and Generation Z, which is the millennium from 2000 to the present age. Now, the Generation XY has been described as the people born between 1965 and 2000. And these individuals are increasingly relying on personal tech devices, such as mobile phones to define themselves, they create social circles apart from their families, and that is changing the way they communicate with parents and, and friends. These generations are more connected than ever. They are more independent. This has been extensively documented. And um, interestingly, the study done by Ephraim within the African continent, Children and youths aged between 13 and 30 years constitute Africans' heaviest users of social media. And that age group is the group for the youths, and they are the ones which are showing what we found during our study. This age group constitutes the generation Y. They are usually the people born between 1978 and 1989 and they've been characterized as self-expressive, group-oriented, global and technology-dependent. Now we, 
we think that we have generational differences based on our data. And in, the, in, in previous studies, which has not looked at genomic research though, the generational differences based on clinical de development, expansion and influences have been described by several It's been described as a gap and is causing value conflict with the adult world. The influence of this generational gap has not been previously described in relation to genomic research participation in Africa. I think this might be a shift from the Afrocentric communalism towards a Western uh, ethos, which is completely different from what we expect in, in, in Africa. And it has ethical implications as regards informed consent, for instance, when we need to get informed consent from, from uh, research participants, uh, it may be become necessary, maybe for instance, during town hall meetings, to, in order to avoid conflict between the different groups within the community, to listen to the different age groups, get to know what their values are, and see how such values can be incorporated so that uh, conflict in terms of consent process can be avoided. And the same thing will apply to community engagement process. If we need to engage the community in genomic research, which is a very sensitive research, then this generational gap or generational shift will need to be considered, as, and also with compensation in research. I mean, an adult who chooses to participate in genomic research would not probably agree to maybe obtaining anything from the, from, the, from, the, from the scientist or from the research team, as opposed to a, a, a youth who feel that, well, for me, it is what I need to gain from it. And if that is not available, I'm not going to participate in it. So it will, it will appear that we have been a sort of a transition from the Afrocentric ethics characterized by communalism, full solidarity into a mis value system where we are seeing a combination of African and Western ethics, where we've seen people who are beginning to imbibe the values of uh, liberal individualism and also not letting go of the communal values that they have learned, uh, which was what we describe as a relative solidarity and which some people have tried to explain as relative autonomy. But relative solidarity and relative autonomy are not exactly the same thing. And of course, at the other extreme is um, a situation where we are going to get in, into the imported Western ethics, where we will have really import uh, Western ethics into our life system and we start practicing liberal individualism. So are we going through a transition? That's the question. Or is it that um, the communal values we have in African ethics is gradually being eroded? So in conclusion, we have a challenge here that foreign values often advocate principles that clearly we know this cannot capture the core aspects of African values, just like the last speaker said, uh, because it will make it appear too Western. This situation, of course, can cause tension and create conflicts in African conception of ethics. In the era of genomics, we need to consider the views and perceptions of the younger generations on African bioethics and seeks to incorporate our tradition. If we, if we choose not to do this, then we might be seeing a transition where the younger generations will gradually drift uh, to imbibe the Western bioethics. So proving the existence of African bioethics in our changing world, we are science and research keep evolving. I do not think that's enough. Uh, as African bioethicists, we need to 
defined within the concepts of the current scientific innovations, what African bioethics is, and make it relevant and applicable to our communities. So this is a finding which was, um, uh, which we observe when we did our research within the West African subcontinent. So we thinking of uh, extending this to other parts of Africa. So there is a protocol that's been developed at the moment, uh, which is be a multi-center research, looking at this concept of generational shift. And um, I, 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 I'll be happy to welcome people on this forum who, who want to participate in this type of research. You can actually contact me and I will send the protocol around and then we can take this forward. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Wonderful. Um, Jan, this has been very thought provoking. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Professor Gundren. Um, um, I can refer everybody to, to the chats. There I see um, Mr. Shawzi shared the, the link to, to your article in PLOS One. And um, I see that there are other interesting comments as well already coming through. For instance, uh, Professor Moodley commented or asked um, whether African communal values differ between urban and rural populations. That's, a, that's another variable um, apart, apart from generation. Um, there can also be an urban rural divide. So there is definitely wonderful research that we can do from an empirical perspective to, to inform us with bioethics going forward. Thank you very much, Professor Agundran. Now it's over to our last speaker, um, um, Dr. Mavis Mach Machirori. Uh, Dr. Machirori is a research associate with the Policy, Ethics and Life Sciences Research Center at Newcastle University. She's involved in a number of interesting research projects on identity, genomics, and health. And her paper will answer the question, what is the possibility of an Afro-Western synthesis in bioethics? Dr. Machirori, over to you. Thank you. Um, and I'm also going to share my screen. So just give me a moment. I'll do that. Hmm. It always takes longer than you think it's going to be. Okay, so I'm assuming you can see the slides. Yes, it's good. All right. Thank you. So it's been really interesting listening to the previous talks because actually I think some of the um, concepts that have been discussed will seep into my talk. Um, and my disclosure is I'm not a, a, I'm not a bioethicist but I, I do have a very strong sociological interest in genomics research and community research. Um, so I use this perspective to think about what we might be thinking of when we talk about African bioethics and actually whether there's a, a space that is missing in these conversations. So my idea is to trouble some of these assumptions um, and critique some of the ways that we can start to think about um, African bioethics, or what I would call a way to bridge these divides, um, something that has been termed an Afro-Western synthesis. Um, so the United Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights talks about bioethics as something that includes medical ethical issues, but also has its originality in the fact that it entails reflection on societal changes and on global balances brought about by scientific and technological developments. Um, on their website, they highlight that a number of scientific practices have extended beyond national borders. And I think this is really important to think about when we think of what an African bioethics might be. Um, because there is also obviously the need now to promote this emergence of shared values um, and this is something as we've noticed is of um, international debate. 
So we've already been given a historical perspective on, on some of the issues in bioethics. Um, so when you look at the literature, some of the um, conversation talks about bioethics as premised on individualism um, and disregards many minority groups, including women. It's uh, based on Western philosophical thought, which was American and post-enlightenment. Um, and over time, you can see the emergence of different bioethics, for example, feminist bioethics, which asks questions about the female form and gender questions, the interaction with medicines, um, asks about education and disability rights. So when we think about philosophical thought, it's actually then not something that's new in Africa or as the continent um, and has its own history that um, is based in religion, but also continues to evolve. Um, it's premised on specific ideas of who a person is and a previous speaker has already touched on this. And sometimes these ideas of personhood are backed by law. And this is something that is very prominent in Western philosophy. Um, but the idea even of Western philosophy assumes that Western bioethics and philosophy is singular and similar across all European countries, but this is something that we're starting to see might not always be the case. So I um, wonder if there are actually similarities or differences with other worldviews when you talk about solidarity, care for community and others. Um, and what is it that we actually want to achieve when you talk about African bioethics? Is it a critique of Western thought? Is it a critique of institutions meant to enforce bioethics? What exactly are we talking about? So to figure out um, some of the answers to these questions, which I think are pertinent to genomics research, we have to take a step back. And like I said, I bring really a social um, critique to this. Um, so bioethics, in my mind, um, has concerns which include social issues as well as obviously the legal um, um, aspects about being human and human identity. So I have to ask, well, what is human? We hear um, different philosophical approaches such as humanism, transhumanism, posthumanism, all these different ways of trying to describe the person in relation or not in relation to their environment. Uh, we have to think about relationship to others, the environment, um, the economy and animals. And in the turn of uh, big data and technology, we also have to include gadgets and technologies. And we've heard from Professor Gunrin that actually in their study, younger people had um, relationships to social media. And I think we start to see, you know, this turn of um, technological data and governance within uh, the definitions of human. And by, by kind of defining the modern human as somebody who actually has this interaction with technology. I don't mean modern by the sense of industrialization, but more in terms of time period. So the ethical concerns that we have um, include what is moral for a person to be or do, but actually we, don't, we haven't defined what a person is and what qualities they have. I think sometimes these issues in African bioethics assume um, certain qualities, but where do these come from? Are they universal or are they found in an individual or in a geographical location? And I ask these questions because figuring out what defines an African person actually helps us define from whom an African bioethics might apply. If we talk about African identity, as I said, is it tied to a place? Is it tied to uh, a person who or what one feels connected to? Is it a birthright that is defined and can be taken away? If, it's, if being African then is an identity that's tied to a place, is there a singular African identity that covers the entire continent? The geographical boundaries within Africa today are very different to how they would have been experienced and demarcated many years ago. And yet when we talk about an African bioethics, we seem to assume that there is a singular way of being African, uh, both sort of on the continent as a whole, um, if disrespecting some of these new uh, geographical boundaries within Africa. And considering that um, the talk about morality and ethics also includes um, religious overviews, can, and looking at the many religions that exist on the continent, can all of these be subsumed into a singular philosophy to guide an African bioethic? Uh, we've heard of um, different philosophers already sort of um, feeding into this. And I think when it comes to genetics discussion, this is really important because genetic data tends to be familial. It gives us information about other people who are related to us. And the familiarity of genomics research means that insights from, um, from Black people, for example, in the UK, might actually raise claims about kinfolk on the continent. So a bioethics should aim to die. So at the moment, Research aims to diversify um, 
research, sorry, genomics research aims to diversify knowledge by bringing in people who are minorities in the UK and the US. And the diaspora um, doesn't have this representation in terms of bioethics. There's at the moment just a group of people who apparently have a lot of information to contribute. But then when we look at um, how people don't take part in research, actually, we, we've started to see that maybe the reasons, uh, let's say, Black people in the UK or in the USA don't participate that much in research is because there's something about the practices in those countries that don't quite fit with the way that they see themselves as citizens or members of publics in that community. We constantly hear that um, Africa contains the largest diversity in genetic makeup, but also when we think back to big data and connectivity, it means that there's an increased ability to link, info, uh, link and create new information about ourselves. So when we think again back to the question of, well, what is it that makes a human? What is it that makes a person African? If information coming from uh, Black people in, or diaspora people in um, Western countries, if that information gives extra insights to people who haven't participated, but by right share some kind of heritage, how far into the past will the knowledge be familial and give insights on people on the continent, for instance? We can see this with some of the um, tribes in the USA, indigenous um, tribes who have rules about participation in genomic research that tend to cover how you can approach um, tribal communities and what kind of research you can do. But actually, there's a gap uh, in, in these ways of approaching tribes because actually people who live in urban areas tend to be missed out. So although um, indigenous populations are trying to protect their communities, there's still sort of this extra space of um, indigenous tribes who live in urban populations who don't tend to be covered by some of these rules. And thinking of technology, um, we're increasingly connected as we've heard from the previous speaker. How many of us here have Facebook or use Google? Considering that these companies are venturing into health and genomics research, are they going to change their practices to suit the way that we think research should be conducted on the continent? Or are we going to have to find a way to um, interact with them in ways that, you know, link with some kind of value of what being African is? So I argue that some of the reasons um, that we need the bioethics is that bioethics should not be divisive, but you take account the different dimensions of humanity and personhood an identity that make a moral person and acknowledges the increasing connectedness that we find ourselves in, in the world. And for this, I offer this idea of a hybrid bioethics versus a Western African dichotomy. A hybrid bioethics for me is reflexive and will be driven by a social critique of the world and social reality. It will enable a conversation between representatives of different African um, identities and, and uh, communities on the continent in relation to those in the diaspora so that there's an oversight um, of flexible approaches that protects both those on the continent and those who claim kinship with it who may not live on the continent. A hybrid bioethics, I think, will critique and disrupt assumptions in both Western and African philosophies, but also critique practices of injustice and inequality and these two, just injustice and inequality, I think are the aims of bioethical practice. So we need to figure out ways of tapping into the resilience of those who navigate these different worlds um, so that we don't other them as kin, othering them as diaspora in the UK and USA, othering them as people who are not on the African continent. Um, and finally, bioethics is not binary. So if we can understand that an African identity is something that is evolving and emergent, then the bioethics that I think we need to be thinking about will also help us um, to figure out the moral ways in which people navigate these different spaces and we actually then start to shift from only a Western or only an African bioethics into more of a third space that isn't just African or just Western, but actually taps into the resilience that people have when they've navigated these, um, these spaces. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dr. Maccheroni. Um, I think those are very important points. Uh, the, the fact that bioethics or African bioethics is not uh, a, a monolithic um, thing and also that one shouldn't just think in, in, in binary terms. Thank you very much. Um, it's now the second part of our colloquium where the floor is open for comments and 
questions from all our participants. Um, this part of the colloquium will be hosted by my colleague, Dr. Freddy Mnyongani. Thank you, Professor Fowler. Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, once again, thank you very much for joining us in this virtual space in order to discuss this very important um, uh, topic of um, African bioethics. Now, to just start us off, I'm quite aware, ladies and gentlemen, that from two o'clock, we've been frantically taking notes, uh, dying to um, comment or ask questions from uh, uh, our different speakers. Um, perhaps to just begin, let me just take us back to the 8th of May, 1996 in South Africa. At the time, the then Deputy President of the Republic of South Africa, uh, Mr. Thabo Mbeki, gave a very important speech that continues to echo even up to today. And I just want to start with the opening lines, and I quote, he said, on an occasion such as this, we should perhaps start from the beginning. So, let me begin. I am an African, end of quote. But now, for the interesting part for me about our gathering today, um, I'm not too sure in relation to African bioethics where the beginning is. I have been monitoring the chat forum to realize that even some of the basic concepts that I thought were already acceptable are still contested. So what is very clear to me is that the whole concept of bioethics is contested, right? And we heard from Professor Effa that we need to gradually build the African movement, which is why I'm asking, we need to start from the beginning as we build that movement, but what is that beginning? And then Professor Metz took us through the whole concept of Afro-communitarianism. And then we moved to Dr. Iwake, who took us through what he called the BC, the BEC, the Bioeco Communitarianism. And then Professor Ogurin took us through a very complicated maze of generational gaps, hmm? trying to locate the different generations. So uh, in my mind, what was emerging was this jigsaw puzzle. Now my question was, how do we put it together so that it can make sense as this, what we call African bioethics? And lastly, Dr. Machirori uh, took us through uh, what I would consider to be a very ambitious project to say, uh, let us bridge the divide. Uh, my question is, if we bridge in this divide, what is on the other side, meaning on the African side? Uh, so I'm more interested in your own input, ladies and gentlemen, and your own questions. And I take it that you are all familiar with the Zoom etiquette. So I will observe here and watch hands as they go up so that you can comment or give your own input based on the presentations. That I see uh, Ama, Kwerewa, Edwin has got the hand up. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm Amma Edwin. I'm a physician, clinical psychologist, and bioethicist from Ghana. I want to say thank you for to the participant to the discussion for such an excellent presentation. My question goes to the um, the professor from University of Michigan. I mean, he raised the issue of consent in research ethics and talked about the need for communal, um, the community overriding individual. I am not clear on that, especially. I know he used it in informed consent in generally, but his presentation focused on research ethics. And I'm struggling to understand how for participating in research, we doesn't directly benefit the individual. If an individual does not want to participate, how, because the community 
to one so that person's rights can be overridden more secondly he also talked about spouse giving consent in my practice as a clinician i often see men or women asking their husband's input when they have to make decisions regarding something like having tubal ligation or anything regarding them I've never seen a man going for vasectomy or any procedure wanting the wife's input. So oftentimes when we talk about spouses, in reality, in often, and I've been practicing medicine for 20, this is my 27th year, right? Or in practice, men get to make decisions on their own when it affects them. But when women are making decisions, either as fathers or as husbands, men have that in and that agency is taken from them. They don't seem to have the same rights in the setting, even when it comes to things. And I can give you instances of women who refused mastectomy, life-saving mastectomy because their husband denied it. And yet a man will not bring their wife in. So when you're talking about these things, practicing it definitely in the area of clinical ethics and medical ethics can be um, challenging. So I would want his input on that. Thank you, Enova. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Professor Ogorin? You are, you are muted. You are muted. How do you, we can hear you. No, you are muted, Prof. Yeah, I was, I was just saying that uh, that question is meant for Dr. Yoke. Um, yes. Yeah, but let me just make one or two comments so that you can now round up. Um, I think the observation made by uh, the, the speaker is quite right. Um, and that's one of the things we find uh, amongst our people in most African communities. Um, the man is the head of the home. So he, the man doesn't believe that um, uh, the, the, the wife should have a say as regards things that concern him, but things that concern the family must be discussed with the man. Uh, in our research, that's, that's one of the things we found out. In fact, we asked the woman and they told us that the man is the head of the home. That's one. The number two, um, the children belongs to the man. Those were some of the narratives we got from them. So anything that has to do with the family, with the children, the mom must know about it. That's one. And then two, um, the, the, the issue of community uh, decision. I mean, when, when you, what some people have, have referred to as community consent is something that as African bioethics, we need to really address. Um, I, I mean, how do you factor community consent into research? I mean, in the context of research ethics, because individual consent is so important. I mean, when, when you take in the form consent, our focus is on individual consent, but uh, where, do we, where do we place community consent? So over to you, Dr. Yoke. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, I don't, I don't uh, anticipate that this is gonna be an easy uh, issue to uh, address. Actually, um, Professor Metz made a number of uh, uh, assertions and indicated that we are not here to provide answers to all the questions. But this is a very uh, outstanding one. And I use that as an example. Of course, I was, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not surprised that uh, it came up as one of the first questions that need clarification. Um, I don't have answers to everything, but I have to say this, that even in my work here in the US, um, I've, observed, I've observed that in certain communities, not just African communities, um, Arab American communities, um, some Asian communities, there are issues whereby medical issues, when people are trying to participate in a research or when they are when they are going through some personal uh, medical issues, it, it might be a very uh, serious one that they find it overwhelming to deal, to deal with as an individual. By the way, I know that there is this understanding that the subjugation
representation of women in our societies, in every society, by the way, Western African everywhere. Um, there's this joke that I know everyone is familiar with that the man is the head of the family, but the women are the neck, right? But the idea of subjugating, uh, uh, the idea that men always subjugate women under their headship is real. But also, as we have seen in uh, Professor Ogurin's uh, presentation, that there is need to factor in this element of freedom on an individual level. Um, I know that there are cases where even the men, when they are maybe at the point of going for a very serious medical procedure, it is not like taking permission from their wives but like discussing it and trying to, you know, brainstorm and get some ideas on how to understand it better because whatever happens to them happens to their family. So it is in that perspective that I'm talking about. It's not that I don't recognize the fact that men generally have this overwhelming control, which of course should be checked. Uh, but it is important that we bring in this idea that the understanding that whatever happens to the individual happens to the small group that he or she belongs to and from that small group it expands so to find a substantive and final solution to how to deal with that the answer to that is not it is what i don't have but it is there that if you, if really we want to uh, find some solutions or rather to project the understanding that we have of our communal or communitarian uh, uh, worldview about our way of life, we also have to bring this in into research ethics. And how to specifically do that, I don't have the complete uh, answer to that. Thank you, Doctor. Um, I see uh, Professor Kimantri has got her hand up. Prof, the platform is yours. Hello. Um, uh, thank you very much to uh, uh, Donrick and Freddie for hosting this fabulous webinar. I think we've been waiting a long time to have a discussion like this about African thinking, African philosophy, and I'm also afraid to use those terms because I'm not sure that, how, you know, how accurate are we when we use those terms? Is it acceptable to assume that the continent has a uniform approach? Does it differ in different parts of Africa, different countries in Africa? Uh, so, so that's my first question. And then the, the second issue is that there is overlap between different philosophical systems in different parts of the world. There's similarity, there's difference. And so, uh, sometimes it might just boil down to having a very individualistic approach versus a communal approach. And so um, uh, I would appreciate some comments from the panel. Thank you, Prof. Um, any takers from the panel members? Yeah, can I, can I uh, just um, give, a, give my own opinion on that? Um, but before I go on to give my opinion on that, I mean, that's a very important point that's been raised there. Um, but uh, I saw from the chat that people were wondering whether there is an uh, impact from where people stay when it comes to what we observe about the generational gaps and commitment to communal values, whether it is based on urban or rural uh, communities. Um, when we did our study, we actually, you know, involve all the uh, involved participants from both rural and urban. And we didn't find any clear division based on that. Uh, it's very interesting because um, even the people who are, living, who are living in the urban communities were making reference to values they imbibed from where they came from, which were mainly rural because you have migration from rural communities to urban communities. So they held on to that. 
So there was no clear division based on that. What we found, however, was um, the impact of level of education, which again can be linked to exposure to technological uh, advancements, uh, which uh, we alluded to with um, the relationship to um, uh, use of uh, social media. Now to, uh, to come to what uh, Professor Modi was talking about uh, in terms of um, whether African communalism can be said to be you know, something similar to all the African countries. From my uh, personal, uh, this based on my personal opinion from what I've studied from the literature, I discovered that virtually all African communities have a common origin. There could be some differences based on you know, where people are, but there is a common denominator upon which our ethos are based. Like for instance, the issue of personhood. Mm -hmm. In South Africa, um, you talk about Ubuntu, is this South African now? Southern African uh, region talks about Ubuntu. In West African subcontinent, we use phrases like uh, people is my clothing. You know, what that simply means, you know, in my language, they, they are saying that my covering is the people. And what that simply means is that without people around me, I'm nobody. Okay, people is my covering. So we all have this common denominator upon which our ethical philosophies are based in Africa, wherever you, from whatever angle you look at it. So I have the belief that we have, uh, for our African bioethical practices, we have a common template. There might be some slight differences here and there based on people's experiences. I do not know what other people think. So based on that, we can actually say there is African bioethics as distinct from other parts of the world. Thank you. Let me quickly add to that, uh, if I may. Um, I teach uh, African philosophy every now and again here in my university. And I started by using this book. I don't know if you can see this. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah as contributions from across Africa. And for some reason, I don't know why I kept it by the side as if I knew I was going to show it to everyone. Um, it talks about African philosophy. And that's what um, the question that people have been asking for ages, especially in the Western world, is there anything like African philosophy? You talk about African philosophy. Who talks about African philosophy? We don't hear, well, all that we hear is Socrates, Plato, and, is there any African philosopher? And then you would go from there to African bioethics. By the way, <clears throat> like all of us know, bioethics generally is a very young field. And it actually is just between maybe 40, 45 years. It started in the uh, late or early 70s and it's still evolving. How much more African bioethics? So, and that actually uh, says a lot about the importance of, you know, our gathering today, which is highly epitomized by Bumi's presentation. You see what technology is doing to us. You see what uh, westernization is doing to us. I mean, all these uh, necessary things that happen in life, when we say influence of Western culture, or not, the, it is a fact of life. Cultures clash, but it is up to us to see how we can sustain our culture and not allow it to be overwhelmed by, you know, features of other cultures. And that is what I see as the very most important part of our gathering here, the emergence of African bioethics. It is about time because we've been talking about it individually here and there, literature, you know, people writing and doing research and all that. It is about time that we do it. And I'm really, really grateful that we have started doing it. Um, on the other point that Bumi talked about in terms of, is there a common perspective to the notion of personhood? 
It is in Africa. Yes, the example that he gave in West Africa, you can translate that into any language of West Africa. You can translate that in any language in uh, Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, and even Northern Africa, even as uh, some uh, efforts are being made to divide us up between uh, south of the Sahara and north of the Sahara and others being merged to Middle East and all that. But if you read the literature, for which we don't have time to refer all the necessary materials to, there is something that connects all Africans to the perspective and understanding of personhood. And there is a lot, a bunch of literature to prove that. I'll stop at that. Thank you so much. Uh, Ilana Leroux has been patiently waiting. The platform is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I first of all want to say thank you to all the panelists for a, a very interesting discussion. Um, I have a very general question really, and I guess it comes down to, as we've mentioned, where is the beginning? Um, African philosophy, a topic that falls under the umbrella of the project of decolonization. Um, <laughs> So being that African philosophy falls under the project of decolonization and decolonization being um, to a degree not undoing what colonialist influence, influence did, but to redress the adverse consequences and to take back um, what was African uh, before colonial influence um, or to reclaim that. If that is where we move or the starting point for uh, decolonization, my question then is, when we have instances like one of the previous questions pointed out, where in some instances men um, or the man in the household uh, makes the familial decisions, but he is not required to necessarily to go back to the, or to do the same, my question then is, if we can go back in decolonization being the umbrella under which this question is posed, that those heteropatriarchal influences have been considered colonial influences. How far do we go back? Do we now respect that traditional um, framework, asking these questions, saying that in certain instances men are superior, or do we go back to prior to the colonial influence when we ask practical questions in the medical setting. Thank you, Ilana. The question is just directed to the panelists, right? Thanks. So I think I'm going to add a little bit of a comment. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Ilana, for the question because as a woman, I sit there and listen to these ideas of what family is and the man being the head of the household. And I must say, part of it makes me um, wonder why this, we continue this discourse. There's something about um, like morals and ethics that will um, sort of take us away from the power dynamics and the power imbalances that are inherent in society. And I think uncritically just adopting this idea of an African bioethics without really figuring out, well, what is it about, you know, that bioethics that we're talking about will just compound these ideas that, you know, particular sections of society have more moral obligations to make decisions. And actually, I think a bioethics that, you know, is in including perspectives in Africa shouldn't be afraid to accept some of the things that we see as good from Western society, but also not be afraid of, cri of criticizing and critiquing some of the bad things that happen within, within Africa as a continent. And I think starting um, from the beginning, we'll be trying to figure out well, what is it that we actually mean? Are we thinking, as um, some people have mentioned, a perspective or many different perspectives from the continent, or are we trying to individualize and universalize this thing that I actually don't think is necessarily possible, even though it's something that we might want to sort of aim for. Thank you. Can, can, I, can I just add something to that? Okay. Yes, bro. Okay, yeah. Um, so uh, I think um, I need to come in here to make a clarification. Um, 
it will appear that we feel that the African um, uh, leadership or the African uh, setup does not recognize the place of women. Uh, I don't think that is true. Um, so again, from qualitative research, you know, some I've had to do some ethnographic research in the past and um, living as a participant in the midst of indigenous communities, I come to realize that the African system is set up in a way that even though the women are made to respect the men as family heads, they also have someone within the community that they call the head of women. Okay, in the West African community setting, or in my language, they call it yellow day. Uh, yellow day means the woman that represents the woman outside. I mean, I'm just trying to simplify that. So this person who is the head of women sits in the community of elders to speak for the woman. She holds meeting with the woman in the community. They express their views, their opinions, and this woman will sit with the kings, the rulers, to tell them that this is the view of women in this community. So women are not really subjugated. So we shouldn't have that conception that the African uh, uh, no, setup does not recognize the place of women. I do not think it's true. So, um, I, although I agree with what the last speaker said, I mean, there are certain things we might find in our you know, way of life as Africans that we feel well, this is probably not right, we need to modify it, that's fine, that's great. Then we get into the hybrid, but um, we need to know exactly what the African philosophy is, just like um, Dr. Yoki said, how we can incorporate the details of it into African bioethics and then we can take that forward. So women are well recognized. So it's just for us to know what is the communal practices, what are the, the things being practiced in our communities. We have market women, they have their leaders. The leader of the market women sits in the committee of elders. So when you need to take informed consent, for instance, I mean, that's one of the things we found in, in my research, you need to take informed consent you not only talk to the community gatekeepers, which we are all familiar with. We have the people we call the subsidiary gatekeepers. Those are the leaders of women, leaders of market women, leaders of uh, Okada riders. The Okada riders are the bicycle riders. Uh, in, in, in Kenya, they call them some other names. Okay, you need to meet all these people, talk to them. So we have leaders of other groups within the community that play key roles now in research ethics, and we cannot neglect them. Very, very important. I'm, I'm sorry for being so uh, audacious to maybe, uh, continue on my question because based on the answers yeah, I think um, I just want to, uh, if I may, um, ask whether then we consider decolonizing ethics or bioethics in Africa, um, by Africans, uh, growing Afri or Africanizing Western principles, because that's kind of what it's sounding like then. Um, or are we actually decolonizing and reclaiming African values and restart, well, starting anew from scratch? That's what it comes down to, um, or my question, I think. Because either we are decolonizing and we are removing colonial influence or we are adapting within a westocentric epistemological framework so i think that's what my question comes down to which way do we move i think it's a bit more abstract question but obviously it has practical influence but um or it has practical application but i think which way do we move um i think my question comes down to if we have to decolonize, are we decolonizing within an accepted Western framework still? Yeah, if I, if I can quickly respond, uh, I use the metaphor of root, hybridize, and replant in my presentation. 
And I think that also was echoed by Dr. Machirori when she was talking about, you know, how can we bring these two things together? How can we see some of the good things in the standard research ethics principles that we are familiar with, and then make them relevant, indigenize them, because we, are, we have our own ways of life. We can't just, you know, bring in Western culture, which is obvious that it doesn't quite fit well with African ways of life. Even though some of us here are still questioning, do we have, do we really have something that is specific to Africa? Definitely we have. And if it will help in any way, I'm going to supply uh, Dr. Tada with tons of literature so that he can share with people who still have that doubt. It is just because it hasn't been publicized enough. We are not familiar with that. So we see some good stuff. In Belmont Report, for example, it is very important to respect individuals. But then we also have our own ways of life. How can we bring these two together and make it work for us? That is the point. And I think I made that. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, and point made and point accepted. Uh, we've got three more hands, or now two. Uh, colleagues, may I suggest that those two or those three be the last ones so that we can begin to round off our discussion because it's now 10 to 4. Rosemary Musasengwa, the platform is yours. Um, hello. So I, I have been listening, you know, um, to the presentation and the comments, and I often feel like when we talk about an African bioethics, we 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 need to, I think, to go back um, to take a step back and think about exactly what it is that you want to address by having an African bioethics. I don't think, um, Ilana, I don't think it's, it's about decolonization as such. I think it's demystifying ethics. The actual issue, I think, um, when I look at it from, from my experience is is that in Africa, we haven't um, paid much attention to our curriculum, even from a very young age. We, we don't teach moral reasoning from a young age, even to our undergraduates. Um, um, I, I was teaching at the University of Zimbabwe, and um, at that time, I, I was teaching clinical ethics, and you could tell that clinicians, they, they don't have that skill to do moral reasoning, and we've never taught that. Um, but now, um, Currently, I'm at Oxford, and I see that they teach moral reasoning right from an early stage at high school level. We ask young people to talk about ethical issues, and they are able to articulate ethical issues. So when it comes to issues of you know, bioethics or research ethics, when they get to that stage, it's, it's not a new concept. So now, I think in Africa, what we are doing now is sort of, we're almost like introducing the concept but it's not really a new concept. And, and like um, Professor Ike is saying, some of these things are, have already been there. Like, you know, the issue of Ubuntu, it's already there, but we don't pay much attention to it. And then when it comes to research, we sort of panic when we get to a, a regulatory perspective now on the part of research ethics. It's like something that is new or imposed on us. I don't think it is. It, it's something that we are not teaching and when someone becomes a researcher, they, they, are, um, they suddenly become, um, they have that form they have to fill for the ethics committee. And that's when they start to realize that they have to think critically and do a lot of moral reasoning, which we have never taught in our curriculum in a lot of African programs. Um, so I think it's, it's more about demystifying ethics itself and moral reasoning and teaching um, young researchers to, to think about how to do moral reasoning. So when we get to a stage where we are talking about something um, high up, like bioethics, innovation, research ethics, they don't struggle to do moral reasoning, which, which is something that I think we are lacking. So it's not really about decolonization. To me, it's demystifying ethics, the way we teach ethics, from which level, from, from a very young level, to teach people to do moral reasoning. So now when we come to that's why we keep seeing the questions in the chat that are saying, even in India, we have these issues, even in other parts of, even in Europe. I mean, here in the UK, we still have issues of consent and other things. They are still there. And the way we deal with things is different. 
because of the history. And people feel like the Belmont report is, is a Western report and we should not be following their principles. We should be coming up with our own principles. But it's not necessarily true, like E.K. is saying, a lot of good things are there. And um, we need to think critically of where we are coming from and how to fix it going forward. Thanks. That's what I was teaching today. Thank you so much. That, that was just an input. Um, I see Dr. Ta the, uh, Professor Tava is slipping. Thank you. Uh, Darrell Mesa, the platform is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been a wonderful uh, colloquium. Thank you very much. I had a couple of comments. One is, uh, from our experience in Asian bioethics. I'm the secretary of the Asian Bioethics Association. We started this association in 1995. There is no requirement that uh, we have only one view from Asian or African bioethics. In fact, I think it's completely counter to the idea, the identity. We celebrate by diversity. Colonialism was to try to say there's one view, but a decolonial sense of identity is to celebrate our diversity. Uh, you might have seen sometimes this uh, television commercial, Malaysia, truly Asia, you know, because of celebrating diversity. That's in very often, you know, common illustration. And I think today we saw, you know, this panel, uh, excellent speakers, thank you Dorrance and other colleagues for organizing. And I think as we continue the dialogue and discourse, we're trying to uncover our own identity and together what we are. Um, and the celebration of diversity is really uh, something which is why uh, many of us uh, keep on doing bioethics. Uh, we'd never pretend that there's only one in fact, there are uh, many, many. Um, so I think how we approach different dilemmas may also change with generations or it may change with particular dominant cultural themes or dominant philosophical views at certain times. But uh, this celebration of getting people together to share their different views is the essence of African bioethics the same maybe of Asian bioethics or even the Eastern or Western or Northern or Southern bioethics. So I thank you to all the speakers, a really excellent uh, job. Thank you very much, Dara. Um, yeah, the discussions have been very interesting. And ladies and gentlemen, I do not want to waste a lot of your time. I would like to thank Professor Effa. I would like to thank Professor Mertz, and thank Dr. Yoki, and Professor Ogorin, and Dr. Machirori uh, for their wonderful presentations. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for having stayed with us for the past uh, uh, almost two hours, and for your contributions throughout the whole deliberations and everything that went with it. But in conclusion, I just want to say that perhaps we need to check at the time, what time is it? This is the time of coronavirus. And the one small good thing that have emerged out of this pandemic is that the virus has thrust us into a virtual space. Ordinarily, this, con uh, this yeah. colloquium would have been hosted at a particular venue for us to discuss this very interesting and contested thing. But what is very interesting for today, we have in this contested debate in a virtual space that is not owned by anybody. And I find that to be very interesting. And throughout the different presentations, what emerged for me is that the whole idea of bioethics continues to be contested. And I know that Professor Metz spoke about harmony. Uh, I'm glad that there was not much of that harmony in our discussion, right? There are areas where we will continue to contest and we might not find each other. But does that mean that there is a crisis? In my view, no. That is how the discipline uh, continues to evolve. And I am happy that we have not as yet found each other at this colloquium. From speaker after speaker after speaker, there were the usual suspects. Eh? 
are we decolonizing or are we demystifying? Huh? There's individualism and there's communalism. Where do we find the bridging divide? There's Africanism and there's also Westernism involved. So I do not know where we are right now with regard to this, our topic of today. But perhaps to quote somebody that you will not approve of, ladies and gentlemen, let me quote Aristotle uh, to conclude. Aristotle once said that a person cannot set out to go and look for what they do not know. Because when they find it, they will not know that they have found it because they don't know it. And if they miss it, they will also know that they have missed it simply because they do not know it. So at the end of this beautiful colloquium, I'm still asking, what is African bioethics? <laughs> Over to you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Nyongani. And um, I would like to, to, to thank everybody who participated, our wonderful speakers, and, and everybody who participated and, uh, and uh, attended this colloquium. Um, we've come to the end, so that's, the only thing that's left to me is just to conclude and say goodbye. We hope to see you at our next colloquium. Thank you. Bye. Thank you Thank for you. the bye opportunity. Bye. <clears throat> Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.